Hi everyone, my name is Gina Paskogan and I'm a co-founder of Final Ball for Yellowface and welcome to today's episode of What's the Tea? A daily conversation with a dancer of Asian descent for the duration of May to celebrate Asian Pacific Heritage Month. In these discussions, I and Phil and I just want to highlight the achievements and experiences of Asians in dance and today I have Geraldine Mendoza here from Joffrey and I'm gonna hand it over to her to, so she can give you some information if anyone wants to donate to her chosen organization. Uh, hi guys, um, I'm Geraldine Mendoza. I'm a dancer with the Joffrey Ballet. Um, we would, or I would personally appreciate it if you have anything to spare, if you could donate to um, my company. It, just simply go to www.joffrey.org slash donate and it will take you to um, a relief fund to help the dancers out. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so tell me, it's it's been a very interesting period of time for every single artist. So how are you doing? What, it, what are you missing right now? What's, what's going on in life for you? Honestly, I, what I miss most is, um, like physical human interaction. <laughs> like I miss hugging my friends. I miss rehearsal. I miss, um, just everyday life. I just, I miss being outside and like being with my friends, being with my family. And it's been hard, especially cause my whole family's in California and, um, I have two little nieces and every time I video chat with them they're like getting bigger and bigger so like that's really sad but um i'm hanging in there um just like everyone else so yeah well, i'm sorry you're missing your little this but hopefully soon we'll be able to see them yeah um, i'd love to know a little bit more about you and i'm sure our viewers are tuning in to hear a little bit more about how did you get into dance training what made you start um, so I have an older sister who's eight years older than me, and um, she actually started ballet when she was, I think, six years old, and so I kind of followed in her footsteps, um, and she didn't really stick with it. She quit when she was 13, but I kind of stayed with it, and my parents, uh, they are from the Philippines, both of them, and... So they didn't have a lot of opportunity growing up. So when they brought, or they didn't bring us, but me, my sister, and my younger brother, we were all um, first generation um, in America. Um, so uh, they wanted to give us as many opportunities as, as they could when we were younger. Um, so I did like swimming, um, basketball, volleyball, Kumon, uh, piano lesson, all, all that stuff. Um, but when I was 13, I stuck with ballet and I quit everything else. Great. Um, would you say that that was the point in time where you were just like, I need to do this as a profession? Or if that wasn't the point in time, will you enlighten us as to when you really got bit by the bug? Um, hmm. I think my when I realized that I really wanted to do it seriously was when I got my first like solo role in the Nutcracker, which was Rose in Waltz of the Flowers. Um, but before that, I really didn't like ballet. I didn't like um, how much uh, time it was taking away from everything else in my life. Um, and I actually almost quit because uh, I I wanted to spend more time with my eighth grade boyfriend mm -hmm. and um, my mom and my teacher were like, uh, you can't do this. Like you're, you actually could do this as a, and have a professional career with it. So um, I just stuck with that and, and getting the role of Rose, I realized that, oh, I think I actually do like this. So then I stuck. Oh, lovely. Um, so you mentioned that your both parents are of Filipino heritage. Um, I don't want to assume that you're absolutely connected to it. Like, can you, can you 
can you explain what your how to what degree you feel connected to your heritage um i unfortunately don't feel super connected with it um it's strange because so my my parents grew up in the Philippines and when they were like 26, they moved to the States for like a, a better life, I guess. Um, and they're very, they're not very artistic people. Um, and I feel like they're, they just wanted to build a life that they didn't have growing up, have like a kind of financially stable life and, and have, like have their kids or make opportunities for their kids. And um, in doing that, I feel like they, every time me and my siblings would ask them questions about when they were younger and like how they grew up, they kind of brushed it off. And I feel like that's very much like a Filipino mentality where they're like very ambitious people and they like they're looking forward they don't really want to look in the past um and so yeah I'm like kind of bummed that I don't know so much about like my parents upbringing um but I I'm I do visit the I used to visit the Philippines often when I was younger um but yeah I don't have like like concrete stories about about their upbringing that i mean that's that's totally fine if it, make, it makes you feel any better my dad's filipino too and yeah. i don't speak the language and i only recently learned that he thought it was the mark of um great success to have his children not speak his native language and so yeah. i too don't really know much about his, like, I know I have a lot of family members in the Philippines, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little jelly that you've been, you've been able to go. I still haven't even gone yet. So that, that's something that I've made a goal for myself to try to reconnect and claim this, this heritage that is mine. Of course, it's ours, yeah, yeah, like yeah. part of our DNA. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's weird how you can have parents that are from a different country and, and then not really have them not really explain anything. Yeah, and it's about. <laughs> What, and and what makes them up? Yeah, and it's so when I was growing up, like they would always speak to me in Tagalog. So I can fully understand the language. But if you ask me to say something in Tagalog, I can't. I like my brain won't like translate. Like I can't. And they never taught it to me. And it's, it's funny because like they're not very expressive people, but they are. I know deep down they're very sensitive and, mm -hmm. and like they never like taught me Tagalog, but if I would try to say something in Tagalog, like they would like kind of take offense to it. Cause I wasn't saying it correctly. Do you know? What I mean? Like, it's like weird. It's weird. And, and they're like amazing parents. Like I love them. They're the, honestly the best, but it, it's like this weird thing where it's like, you didn't grow up in the Philippines. You grew up in America. So like, this is, this is your, like, I don't know. It's hard to explain. It's like, this is our gift to you. This is your, yes. path. like, we want you to yeah. stay here, but, yeah. uh, oh, what an advantage it would be to be able to speak both languages fluently. Yeah. So, it'd be so cool. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we could work on that together. Maybe that could be yeah. like our <laughs> quarantine goal. Yeah, we should do that. We should do it. <laughs> um, so uh, now as a full-blown artist, do you feel like wanting to, to connect to this heritage more, do you think that it could inform your work um, moving forward in your career? Because like that, I, I feel like I would be interested in, in knowing more of the culture and seeing, I mean, it's not a guarantee that it would like apply to ballet, but it might apply to some outside work. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that might be. Um, well, I feel like in, in anything, whether it has to do with art or everyday life, like history is important. It's important to know where you came from. Um, like if you're trying to, I guess if, if you're trying to create a ballet, um, that is trying to tell a story, you have to do research behind it. So 
like of course i would like to know much more about like my filipino heritage um so i don't know it's yeah i don't know his like basically history is important we need to in order to move forward we do need to know about what happened in our past all right lovely so like giving the tools so it's just like as we learn more it's all it's all it's already going to infuse our our artistic choices yeah the more knowledge we have of the past because you can't just forget it yeah um, totally. so my next question is how do you think the ballet world is doing in terms of race and representation? Um, I, I do think we're moving forward. I mean, even though it, it's debatable that um, it's kind of at a slow pace, but we are like having conversations like this where um, it's important to know whether you're offending someone intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and like I said, I feel like we're now at a time where we kind of have to do our research with whatever we're putting out there. Um, and it's, I guess it's um, the responsibility of the person putting it out there to raise those questions, to make sure you're saying the right things, um, make sure you're saying the right message. Um, so I think we are, as a ballet community, move, we are moving forward, um, but we could probably do a bit better. <laughs> Excellent answer. Um, do you, have you ever had any experiences where you felt like you were discriminated again that you feel comfortable sharing it could also be outside of ballet too or you might not have any experience yeah actually to be honest I personally haven't had uh any like racially discriminatory experiences that have happened to me but I do know that they exist um like I guess for example uh we just did a new nutcracker with Christopher Wielden and um, the Chinese uh, character. It was it was a beautifully choreographed uh, Chinese um, uh, excerpt, and uh, I guess with the premiere, the guy had a straw hat, but also had like those. Uh, I, I don't want to sound ignorant, but this like silk um, Chinese. Uh, pants and like uh, top and I guess one of the uh, reviewers said that wouldn't really um, like someone who was wearing like a silk robe of like uh, like they wouldn't be wearing a straw hat with the silk uh, garments and so we heard that and Chris was like okay they're right like so we actually nixed the straw hat and then he was just wearing the the very beautiful silk garments of chinese so right so like the silk garment was more like something like someone of nobility would wear or of or of, of wealth and then you had the rice paddy hat which is generally worn exactly like work in the field so there was a disconnect there and yeah exactly and, yeah, um, that, that totally makes sense. Well, I'm happy that got changed. Yeah, no, it got changed. And the thing is, is like, what's important is that, like, these questions are being raised and they're, they're being brought to people's attention and there's something being done about it. Like, mm -hmm. that, that's where we, like, we also kind of have to give people a little bit of the benefit of the doubt because here he is, he created this whole two-hour ballet and... It might have been like a like a misstep or a, or even a miscommunication, and like we gave him the opportunity to change it, which he did, which I feel like is important. It, it's so important, and it's something that Phil and I really focus in on is how to raise these. Like talking about race is not an easy conversation. Yeah, right? yeah. and 
how to bring that up with someone who you you know did not mean to offend. Exactly. Yeah. And how yeah. to make it be a productive conversation and not one where you're just pointing the finger and and that shuts people down. And it's not yeah. about shutting people down or being the PC police and it's about communicating how something has made one feel. Yeah. And and asking asking a question, did you did you mean to make me feel that way? Did yeah. you mean to do that? And most often times it's not, but that's the, asking in that sort of way still gives them power. It doesn't completely emasculate them and, and make them feel like they're something they're not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think the, the key thing is whether it was intentional or not like that, that's a huge thing. Like, um, some people may not know and like, they might, you might, um, they might realize that for next time they'll do a little bit more research. Um, but right, because like you said, like knowing history is important and researching, yeah. if you want to put this hat on, where did that hat come from? What are the origins of that hat? Yeah. What's the origins compared to like what the character is wearing? So like you bring up a really important aspect that like, doing the work it's not just about picking something that you've seen before because the rice patty hats it's like it's been around in the nutcracker production for a long yeah. time yeah and there are other turns out there are other options yeah yeah and it's a beautifully a choreographed solo like like i love our our chinese <laughs> Or not well, I I look forward to seeing a production at some point. I hope that we're able to at least do a Nutcracker. I never thought I would utter that sentence because Nutcracker is not my favorite I production. But I I'm know. really kind of hoping that we're at least back up and running by Nutcracker. Yeah. Otherwise, yikes. Um, well, taking it back to your to your parents, I'm wondering how they felt about you embarking on this professional career. Um, it's interesting because, like, they have always been super supportive of me, and, um, but they never really grasped the idea of me being a professional ballet dancer until, like, the very, very end. Like, I went to a Catholic Jesuit high school in San Francisco for four years, and I even applied to, like, seven colleges which those applications are expensive. They're hard. <laughs> they're yeah, they're hard. hard and they're expensive. They're, 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 there's a ton of things that go into it. And so like I applied to seven colleges and it was only at the time where I got a full scholarship to School of American Ballet for the summer um, that they realized like, oh you, oh, you can do this for real? Like, you can do this for real. I'm like, yes, I can. I can do this for real. I've been telling you, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like they, I don't know. Cause I, I also never went to like, um, summer programs. Like I stayed in, uh, San Francisco, like for my full training. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. like when they saw that I got a scholarship to go to New York, they were like, Oh, you could, you can actually do this. And I was like, yeah, I can actually do this. So then they trusted me and then they're like super proud, which I'm like happy that they're so proud. Cause I mean, I'm here because of them. Yeah. I'm happy that they're very proud of you too. It's a, it's a really rare thing to be able to get to do what one loves for their profession. Yeah. So you and I are both very, very lucky in that. And yeah. That's exciting that they're very supportive. Even if they, even if it like dawned on them a little bit later, yeah, like, it was well, like that's your commitment. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was super, super late. But um, no, <laughs> they're they're great. That's totally fine. <laughs> um, so, given this experience and this wisdom that you have, what would you say to a young dancer? Actually, what would you say to young dancers right now who are really trying to break forth into a career in dance? Oh, it's tough right now. I, I know you're probably like very worried and I totally get that. Um, I just, just 
I would just tell them to try and stay inspired. Um, I know it's easier said than done, but um, try and find ways to be creative. Um, I, and I, I, I'm a planner. I like things like laid out. So I understand that this is a very scary time for, for a lot of people, especially kids who are, you know, this was supposed to be their first season in, in a company or they were, this was supposed to be their audition season. Um, but you're not alone. Um, yeah, just, I, I would just say like, try and stay active, stay inspired um whatever that may be for you yeah it's just like and you we really are all in this together like yeah. even artists of different professions not just dancers musicians we're all trying to do it it's a little harder for dancers to be able yeah. to practice their craft at home and yeah. that's sort of a bummer but um i think also being gentle with oneself right now during this yeah. time is something that I'm trying to do for myself. Yeah. Um, Cause of course we all want to fly on a stage. I think the next big open stage space I see, I'm just going to break out into a huge menace just because I can. I know. You know. No, I, it's tough. It's tough. I, I know. Yeah. You're right. Also like be, be kind to yourself. Like, listen, like if you do feel like you want to be active that day, be active that day. If you, you don't if you're not into it like maybe skip a day but yeah it's hard yeah. as dancers we're already programmed to be disciplined anyway so it's okay yeah to take a day. yeah and like um, i feel like when we do get back like people are going to be forgiving you know like they're not gonna expect like us to be like in full tip-top shape like it's it's a process so yeah yeah, this is like, like you said, for someone who can plan, there's no way to plan what's what's going to happen next. And we just have to, it, this is just practice of being in the present and practicing dance when you feel the urge for the passion and love of dance. Yeah. Like that's still there. No one's taken that away. Yeah, totally. Totally. And no one can take that away from you. Yeah. So it's super powerful. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And um, which brings us to our very last question already. Um, what do you think? You said that the ballet world could be do, do better. I totally agree with you. What do we think we need to do to build like a loyal, younger, and more inclusive audience? Like how do we get more butts in the seats on a consistent basis? Mm, I think Honestly, I think it's telling real stories. Like, I know we have traditional ballets and that's all great, um, but I think it's important to tell, tell stories from something that is real. Like, for example, like, one of the one of the pieces we just did by Justin Peck, Times Are Racing. Um, mm -hmm. It was so much fun, so rewarding, and it was so relevant. Um, it was a response and reaction to the 2016 election. Um, and I'm just like, I was so grateful that that was the last thing I danced um, because it like, it lingered on with me because like, it was just so, it's important. It's like, it's, I think in order to have a younger or a young, um, what did you say? A young, what were the three? Uh, just, just a loyal people who come back, not just one-offs. Cause I feel like companies are doing a good job of get, like creating these special shows where a younger audience comes in for like a night, but then and the whole audience changes for a night, but we want to like yeah. get them to come back and keep coming back. And yeah. And uh, yeah. So I think we have to create ballets that tell uh, like a real story, like a, uh, something that is important to us. May we have to start telling 
um, stories that are relevant to today, um, that have meaning, that that uh, address social justice issues. Um, I don't know. Another thing I watched recently that live streamed was English National Ballet's um, uh, Broken Wings. It was a uh, life portrayal of Frida Kahlo by Annabel Lopez Ochoa. And it was so beautiful, so moving. And it was um, like uh, a history lesson. Yeah. And it was like, I think it's important to tell those stories to, um, I don't know, it's just, it bridges a gap, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, you like, know, like we're always going to have these traditional stories of like the 15 year old that like it comes from a privileged, <laughs> you know, like royal background and is betrothed at 15. And some, that's kind of weird in this space to be like someone of our generations to go see. Cause like that would never happen, very rarely, rarely yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, I know arranged marriages still exist, but like, it's just, it's just like, you can't, it's not something you turn to your friend and be like, oh yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so-and-so got me. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, exactly. So I think exactly. also having like, first getting them in the seats with like, but like you said, like new and relevant stories and then showing them like, oh yeah, there's this beautiful, beautiful full length called Giselle. And you know, it's, it's got a different storyline, but you can also update those storylines. Yeah, too. exactly. So I think it's like finding a middle ground here. Yeah, it's the message behind the behind the ballet, is is what is important. Like, yeah, I think you also like touched on something super super interesting. Is that like people want to be told stories, and I feel like a lot of our new our new ballet, is the contemporary works are just storyless, but they're uh -huh. and I think that's something that draws someone in. Like we as humans love to be told a story and love to see a story play out. I mean, like, and I think there is room for that in the ballet world now to create like maybe new full lengths or shorter, you know, shorter 40 minute pieces that tell a narrative of some sort that like, like you said, is relevant. Yeah, totally, totally. And like, yeah, even, even, the abstract pieces they can also tell a story like in the little like footnotes you can also explain like what they're trying to say and it's important to have um it's important to have those stories be of today like we already know the stories of the past what's happening today so yeah yeah it's a wonderful answer um and that brings us to the end. I want to thank you so much for spending some time with me. It's lovely to get to know you. And I can't wait to see you dance more. And to our viewers and followers, thank you for tuning in. And check out our Instagram page, Final Bow for Yellow Pace. Face, not Pace, Yellow Face, right now <laughs> for the reveal of who the next dancer chat will be. <laughs>